Welcome to the next edition of our uh, International Talks in Lviv. And today we will have extremely extinguished, uh, wonderful guests. Uh, and we will have uh, Janusz Bugajski, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Jameson Foundation in Washington, D.C. And uh, Uliana Suprun, head of NGO RQA uh, and a former Minister of Health uh, of Ukraine. Uh, welcome to our studio and thanks for coming. Happy Thank to you. Be here. Thank you. Um, I would start maybe with Oliana Suprun. Uh, you previously uh, had to struggle and you were struggling a lot for the health of Ukrainians. What are you struggling now today? Um, well, uh, in the last year, all of us have uh, been faced with a great struggle because of the um, uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. And I think all of us have had a, uh, a big struggle to try to fight off their aggression as well as to try to keep our lives as normal as possible because I think it's important that each of us fights our own fight. So people like yourselves should continue to have your, uh, your uh, media expanding as you have into KU. We should continue to have shows like this. We should continue to write books. We should continue to treat patients um, because if we don't do that, then what are we actually fighting for? Uh, what are the soldiers that we send to the front fighting for if we're not continuing to build on and progress our life in Ukraine? So what we've done is uh, a couple of years ago, we founded an NGO, RQA, which is a publishing NGO. And we have an online journal, and it's arc.arc.ua, which publishes both in Ukrainian and English, as well as in a lot of other languages. And we publish books. The first book we published was my book, uh, Moche Mantu. Um, we also published a uh, translation of Robert McGee's book, Opovid, which is a, um, a, a book that helps to describe how to uh, tell a story uh, with the best possible form so that you can convey that which you want to tell other people. And then our most recent book is a translation of Janusz Bogajski's book. In English, it's called Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture in Ukrainian, Nespromozhna Derzhava, Instrukcija z Rushmatovania Rusi. Uh, Janusz will tell you a lot more about the book, but we were happy to um, meet him online first uh, at a distance uh, when we were writing an article about smuta, which is the, the fear that the Russians put into their people so that um, they don't want to see any changes, any, any change in government, any change in regime. And we found that Janusz was the, one of the very few uh, Western experts who had some idea about Smuta and about what the Russian Empire really is all about. So after we spoke to him, we found out he was writing this book and um, he had written it before the full-scale invasion. He'll tell you more about it. So we decided that it's important for this book to also come out in Ukrainian. Um, and we're translating it into Russian because we think that uh, those who speak Russian, be it in the Russian Federation or in other places around the world, really should have access to Janusz's book. So our organization is working on continuing to provide a space for Ukrainian authors as well as uh, non-Ukrainian authors to write about Ukraine. Um, and we feel that Ukraine doesn't have enough of a voice in the West. The programs yeah. like mm -hmm. yourselves are very helpful so that in the English language, the truth about Ukraine is starting to come out and um, be recognized around the world. Thank you. And that's why we, we have we like to speak also with not only with people coming from outside, but also people who lived here for, for a longer time and do understand the Ukrainian mentality and the context of everything that is happening here. Getting back to experts, Western experts, uh, um, right before invasion, uh, we published a special edition, printed edition mm -hmm. of our newspaper mm -hmm. saying we will resist five reasons why Ukrainians will win. And uh, it went to printer on the 22nd, on a, it was designed on the 22nd of February and it went to printer the night before invasion. Uh, we came up with that message because we met so many people here in Lviv who came from Kiev, from first international journalists who came from different parts of the world. And we've, we felt that they didn't believe 
in Ukraine. And what do you think about why was why were Western analytics wrong in their prognosis uh, before the invasion? Yeah, great question. Uh, for, for several reasons, I would say. First of all, a lot of the so-called Russia analysts or Russia experts in the United States, particularly in Washington, have always been schooled with a sort of Moscow-centric view of the region, not just vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but also vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And this idea that Mos somehow Russia is permanent, uh, that, that um, the other part of it is that we are exaggerating the threat that Russia poses. Uh, I remember at my organization, Jamestown, several of us were warning for a long time about the fact that Russia was poised to enter in a, ma in a massive way, that it wasn't just exercises. We have military experts, uh, that this was the, the precursor to a full-scale invasion. But a lot of that was ignored. Partly, I would say it's, it's Western wishful thinking that somehow Russia has been tamed or can be tamed. Mm -hmm. If you remember, even our administration, the Biden administration on the eve of the invasion was talking about parking Russia, dealing with China, um, uh, that somehow we can, we can, uh, we can deal with Russia in, in a non-confrontational way. The other part of it, I would say, is a complete, uh, let's say, misinterpretation by uh, American military experts, those that studied Russia, who have <laughs> spent their time looking at official documents and official statistics, uh, rather than looking at the state of Russian society, including mm -hmm. its corruption. Mm -hmm. As you know, the military reflects society. Russian military reflect, ref, ref, reflects Russian society, which is deeply corrupted, particularly the elite. And we saw the results of that when the Russian tanks started rolling in, that they couldn't handle uh, concerted resistance by people determined to protect their country, protect their, their families, their, their children, and so forth. So I would say both things. One, misconception about Russia. Two, complete mis misunderstanding, misreading of the Russian military. Uh, what do you think the world has learned so far from, from this situation? That's a question to both of you. What, do you want me to? Dep mm -hmm. Depends who in the world. I don't... The, the world, thankfully, is not a collectivity. Mm -hmm. A lot of people learned a lot of different lessons. Uh, I mean, the Western, the Western, the West, world, okay, yeah. the Western policymakers, to be specific. Mm -hmm. One, they have realized, yes, that Russia is an imperial power. Two, yes, that Russia is rapacious and uh, still wants to reconquer territories that once belonged to it under a different form of Russia, the Soviet Union. Uh, thirdly, that uh, if a people want to resist are given the weapons uh, and um, uh, are given the chance, the training and everything else, the wherewithal to construct an army, they will defeat the Russian army, that Russia is not invincible. However, I would say with one caveat, the lesson hasn't still been fully learned at the highest policy levels. They still think that somehow, despite everything that's happened, and I'm talking even about the government in Washington, but also many European governments, they still think that somehow the status quo can be restored. Uh, in other words, that somehow at some point after Putin goes, we can go back mm -hmm. to business as usual with Russia. Maybe not as usual, but still business with Russia. And sometimes I hear this even in conversations outside Ukraine. I went to the to Perugia festival just few, two weeks ago, uh, journalism festival, and I heard so many of these narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like that the, they are kind of preparing the world uh, that, that to, under, to take a message that only Putin is uh, the only responsible and without him, everything might be different. Well, the problem is that in, in each administration, US administration is guilty of this. We personalize our relations with Russia. Do you remember Yeltsin, the great savior, great Democrat? then Putin, the great pragmatist. And now the, whoever comes after Putin is going to be a reformer, somebody we can make peace with. It's this misunderstanding, misreading of the Russian system, of the system of government, of the economic structure, of the mentality and ideology of these people. I think one of the things the world has learned as well is um, the true nature of Ukrainians. Um, how tenacious we are, that we are not Russians, we are different than they are, 
And um, uh, as uh, uh, Kuchma uh, had written a book that said, Ukraine is not Russia, I think that we need to move away from that and stop saying who we're not and say who we are. And Ukraine has firmly said we are Europeans, we are uh, prospective members of NATO, we want to guarantee security to the world and we're ready to fight for it. Um, we're not asking for other people to, write, to fight for us. We'll fight for our own territory. We just need the support and the help of the rest of the world to do so. When I uh, travel outside of Ukraine and I speak to people in the UK or in the United States or other countries, I see that they have a completely different idea of who Ukrainians are. And um, I think it's about time, you know, 30 years after independence and after almost a thousand years of being under Russian imperialism that we as Ukrainians have been able to um, uh, start to talk about our own identity and to show who we really are. And we definitely have, have a lot to show about. But first we need to uh, win in this. So we know that we will definitely win, but uh, it takes time. Why do you think the West is sometimes so slow with weapons uh, oh. support to Ukraine? Well, precisely for these reasons, I was saying the, the, the idea that uh, if, if we provoke Russia too much, mm -hmm. that Ukraine uses long range weapons to attack Russian territory, that somehow Russia will escalate mm -hmm. and escalate it to a nuclear level. I think it's a lot of fiction. I think it's a lot of unnecessary fear and it's generated by Moscow. That's why they keep talking about nuclear weapons. Even now, during this supposed counteroffensive, they're talking about Ukraine attacking Russian regions. Why? Why are they doing this? Because they're trying to point the finger at Kiev to Washington saying, stop them, stop this counteroffensive because their real aim is to attack Russia. See, the West is bought into this Muscovite narrative that Ukraine is out to destroy Russia. Ukraine is out to liberate its territory. And if that means taking out Russian logistics, Russian troop supplies, Russian infrastructure that affect the attack on Ukraine, it's very, it's completely entitled to do so. Uh, the reason the long range weapons haven't been supplied is precisely because of this fear of escalation and this fear of a nuclear threat. Do you mean that they are still uh, taking these narratives as, as truths and they do believe that what's what they yeah, say I, I, I think Russia? they, I think, our, uh, let's say some advisors of our president still believe that Russia can be, uh, can escalate even further, even beyond Ukraine, if we give Ukraine too many weapons. Ukraine has proved that they cannot do it conventionally. They cannot even take a village in Donetsk, right? For, for how long? In the Donbass, for, for the last eight months, nine months, backward? Um, how on earth can you expect that sort of military to attack beyond this, beyond Ukraine? It's, it, it's really lazy thinking, I would say, in the part of our administration. The nuclear issue, let me raise this also. It, it's, it's not conceivable that Russia would use strategic nuclear weapons against the United States or against any NATO country, because that would mean nuclear suicide. Uh, that would be the end of Russia as we know it. Every major Russian city would be hit very quickly. Um, they will not use nuclear weapons also against Ukraine. They've been warned very sternly that any use of nuclear weapons will result in act NATO action against Russia in Ukraine. Not necessarily in Russia, but in Ukraine, Black Sea Fleet and so forth. So also the use of nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons against Ukrainian forces will be counterproductive. Uh, it's not going to gain them any ter territory and it's not going to gain them any friends. Even China is dissociating itself fully from that. So, uh, but the fear is still there. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. This is the true Russophobia and the rational fear of what Russia will do. Not the way the Russians depict it, that Moscow depicts it, but the way it actually works in practice. So I would say our administration is, and, and many administrations in the West are the actual Russophobes. We have an irrational fear of Russia. I remember we had in the first days or first weeks after invasion, we had in the studio conversation with a um, well-known psychoanalyst, Roman Ketchor, a uh, professor from Catholic University in Lviv, who said that, who, who learns a lot about psycho of Russia and Russian people and Putin uh, personally. And he observes and he said that 
by all signs that he see as a doctor, as a clinicist, that he is afraid, he is extremely afraid to die, and it means that mm -hmm. he will never use uh, nukes. It was in the first days after invasion. Somebody and, who and sits, still... exactly, somebody who sits 40 feet away on mm -hmm. a long table from a guest is afraid of a single virus, right? How is he going to, how is he not afraid of nuclear weapons? <clears throat> And then those uh, oligarchs who've amassed uh, money for so many years and power, mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to lose that. Why would they allow something like that to happen? As the same as, as Putin, who has also amassed all the power and wealth. It would be, again, in, not in their best interest to do so. And paradoxically, it's not us he has to fear, it's his own people. Exactly. Uh, coming back to support, Western support and with weapons, uh, there was a recent publication in Foreign Affairs uh, where um, well, the authors say that uh, West has to prepare for uh, countries for support of uh, Ukraine's military for a long war. And we have to think of long-term uh, support in case that if if counteroffensive is successful, it doesn't mean that the conflict will end absolutely. So it may be some pause for a year to five. They say that, what, what they say in this publication, and what do you think about it? Uh, should we think also not only of the uh, counteroffensive and taking back uh, all our lands, Ukraine, and getting Russians, Russian soldiers, troops out of Ukraine? But what should be uh, the next steps? It's a very good question. I'd answer it this way. Maybe Ulana has a few other thoughts. First of all, even with the liberation of all of your territory, including Crimea, there is still the possibility, this prospect, that they will try it again in a few years. But in order to do that, they would have to rebuild their military forces, their military structure, which has been badly depleted because of Ukrainian uh, defense, and, uh, and the coming counteroffensive, But to do that, they need economic resources. So what Ukraine has to do and tell the West for the future is do not lift sanctions. Do not change, in fact, stiffen sanctions until <laughs> I would say, well, the, the, uh, the sort of core of my book is Russia begins to rupture and new states emerge. In other words, there are three pillars to assure Ukrainian security. NATO membership, the presence of NATO troops on Ukrainian soil, including American troops, just as they have, uh, we have in Poland. And thirdly, the rupture of Russia. In other words, when Russia starts to rupture, the power structure begins to disintegrate, republics and regions start to grab power, new states are emerging, we have to reach out to them to make sure these new countries no longer are a threat to any neighbor. So those are, I would say, the three pillars for ensuring security beyond the liberation of all of Ukraine. Let's talk now about your book, The Failed mm -hmm. State and the Guide to Russia's Rupture. Uh, who is the book for? And uh, I know that you, you've started uh, writing it before the invasion, of course, and you just finished it last year, yes? Yes, yes. Well, the book is for really the American and European policy community. In other words, it's not simply an analysis, which it is, mm -hmm but it's also a prognosis and it's a guide to action. Uh, I, I devote a whole chapter of recommendations to what the Western governments should be doing. And when I say Western governments, I include Ukraine actually in that as well. All European governments should be doing in order to deal with, with the Russia that's on the verge of fragmentation. So it's aimed at a sort of to better inform the state of play in Russia. In order for me to give those recommendations though, I have to explain to them what are the conditions in Russia, why it's a weak power, why its weakness has been exposed now by Ukraine. Ukraine has done enormous service, I think, to international security, not only by defeating the Russian army, but by exposing the fragility of the Russian state. Uh, so this is part of the purpose of my book. Why should people in the West all these policymakers care about rupture of Russia? Well, because it will have a major impact, uh, not only on Russia itself, obviously, but on all neighboring countries. As you know, Russia borders, uh, what, 14 countries, by, whether by land or by sea. I mean, I don't know of any other country that borders so many because of the expansion of the empire uh, since the, 
since the 14th, 15th century. So all these countries, one way or another, are going to be affected by what happens in Russia, whether negatively or positively. And by negatively, I mean if there are, which I do envisage, some civil wars in Russia, some conflicts, mm -hmm. violent conflicts in Russia, they could spill over borders. They could precipitate the outflow of refugees, uh, as we'd witness refugees flowing out of Ukraine towards Poland, Slovakia, and so forth. On the positive side, I would say that the, the emergence of new countries, these new countries will want to establish relations with their neighbors. So, so for instance, countries like Kazakhstan, countries mm -hmm. like Japan, like Georgia, like Ukraine have to be, and Finland in particular, have to be prepared for potential emergence of new states with which they would want to establish, presumably, good relations, uh, cooperative relations. And quite frankly, some of them, particularly um, in the European side of Russia, could become partners for NATO, prospective members of the European Union. There's another part of this which Uliana and I have been talking about, what I call transpacificism. In other words, there are countries that will emerge in the Far East that will look towards Japan, the Eastern democracies. It's not just the West that has democracies, the East does too. The whole Pacific Rim has democracies. In other words, Canada, US, uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, Australia, New Zealand. I think some of these new uh, countries that will be emerging will look for security to these countries, not just vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, but also vis-a-vis -vis a China that may have some uh, ambitions towards their territory and resources. So we thought mm -hmm. we should translate it into Ukrainian because, as Yanush said, he includes Ukraine in uh, one of the countries that he advises on how we can be pre better prepared for not the possibility, but the inevitability of Russia's rupture. Um, we translated into Ukrainian so that um, both the uh, government uh, structures, uh, those representatives of government who should be preparing us as Ukraine um, for this inevitability, as well as for those people of uh, regular Ukrainian citizens who want to read more about this. Um, we also, uh, just um, as an aside, have a bit of a Lviv connection because the illustrator, we have uh, special illustrations that were made for the Ukrainian publication of the book. The illustrator is from Lviv and her mm -hmm. name is Olanka Zahorodnik. So we have mm -hmm. new illustrations. We also mm -hmm. in Ukrainian have a separate and um, uh, Ukraine, Ukraino-centric uh, stoop or um, introduction uh, to the book, as well as having translated Yanush's introduction into the book. Um, we also, as I said, have translated, are translating it into Russian so that it could then go to those Russian speakers, both uh, those that are um, leaders of the emerging uh, countries, nationalities, possible states, possible federations that will um, emerge after the uh, collapse of the Russian Federation so that they have a bit of a roadmap on what they can follow. But one of the most important things I think that Janusz uh, writes about in the book is that um, he is not advocating for the West or the East or Ukraine to be actually involved in the dissolution of mm -hmm. Russia, but to be prepared for the dissolution of the Russian Federation. It's inevitable. It's going to happen, and we need to be ready for it, unlike the dissolution of the Soviet Union or the Tsarist Empire when most of the West and most of the world apparently was unprepared, even though there were so many warning signs that it was going to happen. We shouldn't make that mistake a third time. We should be ready for it this time. Uh, that's why we, I, I hope that more and more people will read it as soon as possible. And uh, so you do believe it's inevitable. But how do you change people living in Russia who are uh, afraid for, they are afraid for decades, I would say for centuries, or for if we're talking of a democratic country uh, of a Russian Federation or like um, uh, semi, uh, not, not um, if we're talking of the uh, democratic state that they are pretending to be, people uh, through these few decades have never tried to go out and stand against the power. Uh, we had a conversation with the TV Rain uh, editor and also in Italy in the festival just a few weeks ago. And he was saying like, oh, we are, we are, we are, we don't, we are against war. Uh, 
uh, we are good journalists. And then the editor of Ukrainska Pravda simply asks him, uh, when Politkovska was killed, did you go, did you stand up and say anything? Uh, did you go to protest? Are you protesting against the war? So even the people who are calling themselves uh, extremely intelligent there, they are not doing it. How, how do you think the mind of Russia maybe changed to, to mm -hmm. make this dissolution? Happen? Yeah, I, I would challenge that history of Russia. There have been periods, and even quite recent, where the citizens of Russia, and I prefer to call them that rather than Russians, mm -hmm. because there are many that are non-Russian, and there are many divisions of Russia, which I'll explore in my book. But there are periods in history where the citizens of Russia do rebel when there are triggers. It happened after the collapse of Tsarism. I mean, how many predicted that there'd be mutinies in the army against the great, a great, against the great Tsar? Remember the old Russian saying, we have two allies, the army and the navy. Well, what happened to them? They rebelled against you. That happened during, uh, during the collapse of the, of the Tsarist empire. And then we had civil wars, remember? Even after the Bolsheviks took over, uh, we had for the next 10 years, civil wars. And they weren't just wars between the Bolsheviks and the, and the uh, Tsarists, the whites. There were also wars against an independent Ukraine, against an independent Georgia, Armenia. You know, the list goes on and on. Only a few countries managed to extract themselves, of course, Poland, Finland, Baltic states. Ukraine, unfortunately, uh, was left, most of it, within the Soviet Union. Part of it was acquired by Poland. Uh, but the other revolt actually was when the Soviet Union collapsed. It mm -hmm. wasn't just mm -hmm. the Union republics that were declaring independence. There were a number, several dozen uh, regions within Russia, not just the autonomous, so-called autonomous republics, that were declaring their sovereignty. Uh, remember Yeltsin's famous phrase, swallow as much sovereignty as you can. Then he reined it in. He, he, he undermined that developing federalism, confederal structure with some countries trying to leave. Best example is Chechnya, of course, which declared its independence and it was brought in. The last point I want to make is revolutionary situations create triggers. And we don't know at this point who the leaders are. But when conditions get so bad and the state cannot provide security, cannot provide economic benefits, economic living standards, then the, the, the state itself is threatened with rupture. And local populations, local leaders will arise of various kinds, whether religious in some places, political or even regional. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how I, the, the, precisely the scenarios I develop in my book. And I think that we should also not believe the Russian disinformation, which tries to make us believe that um, uh, the entire Russia is one mass mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. uh, a monolith, monolith mm -hmm. of uh, Russian uh, people because there are very many different ethnic groups and even within the uh, Russian uh, people themselves, the mm -hmm. ethnic Russians themselves, many of them who have moved into the regions have now become much more um, uh, attached to the region that they're living in rather than to their Russian ethnic background. So many of the regions have been exploited for so long by the Russian Federation, where much of their wealth is taken out and given to Moscow and St. Petersburg to do with as it wants, and very little returns to the relatively rich uh, regions that um, that have been providing the oil, the gas, the diamonds, the rare earth metals, those are the kinds of things that um, really creates a resentment within the regions. So I think that we need to stop believing the Russian disinformation. You know, the maps mm -hmm. they used mm -hmm. to have where um, there was Europe and then this big red mass that they called Russia mm -hmm. and still do. It really isn't a big red yeah. mass. And, and yeah, j j just to add one thing, if you remember the collapse of the Soviet Union, we, a lot of people wonder, well, where are the leaders going to come from of these new movements? Mm -hmm. The former communist apparatchiks, former communist leaders, who suddenly turned towards national liberation, national independence. In many cases, it was uh, uh, independence by default, which may also begin to happen in, in the Russian Federation. So there is hope. Oh, there's huge hope. I mean, okay. I, I'm an optimist, but I base it on facts. And there's a lot of um, uh, opportunity as well. If it's planned and managed, then there is a vast amount of opportunity where there will be new emerging countries with which to have diplomatic and economic relations. 
and new development in that part of the world, which hasn't had the opportunity to develop itself for very many years because they've been under Russian rule. Thank you. I'm, I do already want to start reading this book right now. <laughs> and we are having this conversation in Lviv. I know that your grandfather mm -hmm. comes from here. Yes. Uh, can you, ha is it your first time here or do you, so you're, you, you know Lviv already yeah, a little bit. Well, what is your impression from today's conversation? I know that you had conversations in different universities and uh, um, what are your reflections? Well, yeah, in brief, as, as you said, I'm, I'm a Lvivian, I suppose. My, <laughs> my grandfather was born in Lviv, his family go I'd like to research more on this, go further back uh, uh, in, in Lviv, in Galicia, in Halicina. Halicina. And uh, my mother, actually, his daughter was born in Rivne. And uh, I visited Rivne yesterday and also went to the village in which they lived. It's a little village very close to Rivne called uh, Tomachiv, uh, before the war's Tomaszów. It's a Polish family. Mm -hmm. um, so my grandfather, after... Uh, the First World War, when the Polish forces defeated the Bolsheviks, and he was in the Polish legions at, with uh, Marshal Piłsudski. Um, if you remember the history, drove the Bolsheviks back, mm -hmm. and there was a plan at that point for a, an independent Ukraine. Piłsudski very much supported it, but for various reasons, because of uh, other uh, Polish politicians and Western restraint, that never came to fruition. That was a huge mistake, actually, by the West at that time. It would have strengthened Ukrainian statehood and independence. And during the Polish rule uh, of Western Ukraine, uh, my family received some land. They were Osadniks. Uh, they received some land in the village and they lived with other uh, families, including Polish families and Ukrainian families. So to answer the other part of your question, I went back actually in 1990. Uh, to, to look at the village because they were all deported to Siberia. And the land was taken? The land was collectivized and, and taken by the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was taken not just from the Poles, it was taken yes. from the Ukrainians. And it was Ukrainians also were deported. I discovered actually while I was there that um, in addition to Kulaks, there were also uh, Ukrainian Catholics that were deported alongside the Poles and the so-called Kulaks, the the rich, what's the word in Ukrainian? That's the Russian Kurkul. word. Kurkul. 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 Mm -hmm. um, My so, family went through the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, they were deported. I was the first, actually, when I went there in 1990, uh, and I met with the uh, Ukrainian uh, people that were still there, the villagers. Uh, the oldest people told me that they remember that deportation very well. They remembered members of my family. And they said that I was the first uh, Pole or descendant of those families to have come back after what 1940 50 years at that time so we've uh, we visited the ukrainian catholic university mm -hmm. and franco university today in lviv um and uh, we had wonderful discussions mm -hmm. in both air in both of the universities yeah. one was part of a conference um on uh, uh how what is ukraine's role in development of a new system of um of uh defense in the world or or security in the world um, and then at the Catholic University, it was more of a presentation for the book. Um, both of them, very interesting questions, uh, very challenging questions, which is always uh, a good thing to hear. Uh, we also were in Rivne, mm -hmm. had book presentations in Kyiv at several universities at the Diplomatic Academy, um, met with mm -hmm. some of the members of government. But really, in the end, what we, what we need to do is um, we need to get the West uh, and the Western leaders uh, to to um, accept the fact that Russia's rupture is inevitable and to start planning for it so that we as Ukrainians won't be the ones that suffer from that rupture and that it is better planned than was the, down, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And if I could just add, because you asked mm -hmm. me about my impressions on Lviv, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Lviv is in the perfect position, uh, position to position itself as a hub, not just for economic reconstruction, not just for a conduit of military assistance, but also as, as a capital of intellectual thought and policy planning for the future of the region, both, both in terms of Ukrainian-Polish relations, but even further afield, I would say. Looking north, looking south, looking towards Belarus, looking towards the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, um, because I do believe that uh, Poland and Ukraine will become the hub mm 
new security and economic development hub in Central Eastern Europe. And I think Lviv is perfectly positioned as an intellectual capital, as you know, for, for, for many, many years, many generations, to again show its leading role in this, in this region. I think, as I can sometimes call it, uh, very modestly, just the best city in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for, for this conversation. And can you also tell our audience where they can find the book? Uh, in Ukrainian, the translation, Nespromozhna Derzhava, can be purchased at bookstores because it's in very many mm -hmm. of the bookstores, um, such as Kneharnya Ye, uh, Sense Bookstore in Kyiv and others. But also there's a website. It is failed state dot com dot ua where you can purchase mm -hmm. the book directly and um i i if you'd like to read it in english it's also available on the jamestown website um, where you can download the pdf and read it in the english language as i said the ukrainian language one does have additional illustrations and a ukrainian mm -hmm. um, introduction which is not available in the english language and um, pretty soon uh, if you'd want to pass it along to any of your Russian speaking friends and we'll have a Russian edition out as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Poland, the Polish edition, Polish edition yeah. likely as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you were saying even Bulgarian a Bulgarian edition is coming. My wife is Bulgarian, so we have very good contacts in Bulgaria. And there's also a, a Montenegrin or Stokavsky version for the uh, Western Balkans. Uh, Janusz also wrote an article for our um, online journal ARC.UA, ARC.UA. It's in both uh, in Ukrainian and in English. It's called um, Mapping the Dissolution of Russia. And um, it uh, also is a, is a shorter synopsis of many of the ideas in the book, but a little bit different take on it. So it doesn't replace reading the book. Mm -hmm. And that was translated into 12 languages. Into 12 actually. languages, yes. So the whole world is now being prepared for the Russia's uh, dissolution. But what, what, what we, what all of us, what each of us can do to make it happen uh, you know, in time and more, more right, more in a right way. So that we, and we are pre being prepared, right? What should all of us, except policymakers, do? We should read the book. You should think about it. You should tell policymakers whenever you meet them in the West. I, I actually, you, you led me into one interesting thing. We were in, in Bucha uh, earlier this week, where I also had a book presentation. We actually had some very good questions about... I prefer questions from ordinary people than I do from academics, <laughs> oftentimes, because they, they know the sort of raw, mm -hmm. raw facts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one thing I said to them after looking at this massacre site and the monument and the flowers, um, I said, tell the people that come here, the diplomats, the ambassadors, the dignitaries, it's all very well to pay respect, of course, to those that were massacred, those that were killed by the Russians. But much more importantly, we don't want this to happen to our children and to our grandchildren. So please make sure that you push and promote the disintegration, the mm -hmm. rupture of Russia. So this can never happen again. I do understand. That's a very strong point. And uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for making all, getting all this intelligence expertise to now the public. And we hope that uh, we will, each of us will do the right thing after reading that book. Thank you and uh, welcome to visit again uh, failedstate.com.ua and read the book. Thank you for the great Thank conversation. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you very much.